I author content for the Mississippi Department of Education, and I really believe in tier one. And so through my company, Educate, I've authored kindergarten through eighth grade English routines and span and Himilcon and I have worked on Spanish tier one routines. And that's currently what we have uh, available for professional learning and just to be able to 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 consume. So that's it about me, but I'd like to tell you about who the real main show is all about and has always been about in my mind for five years. We sat on the in the Lexia um, research division together for about three years. And that's when I really became fascinated with Himmelkhan's brain. Every single conversation that I've had with Himmelkhan in the last five years been riveting. I've learned something from him every single time. And I think that you will as well. Currently, he is a PhD candidate in Berkeley, which is so phenomenal. He's a former public school educator. He has some new content that he will have out on January 3rd. I cannot wait. And uh, it is just such a great opportunity to be here today. So he'll talk to us about how to structure our Spanish literacy block. And with that, I think that it's all about you, my friend. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Stacey. And thank you so much <laughs> for hosting today's session. Um, thank you so much, everyone who is joining, has joined, has been waiting. I know giving up time on a Saturday morning after a busy week is invaluable, so I very much appreciate it. Uh, I think what I would like to start with is a little bit of context about myself linguistically, and then I'll lay out an agenda of what we'll cover today, and we'll take it from there. At any point, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. Right now, the we have a manageable number of participants, which is great. So as long as you're able to unmute and you have a question, please do. At some point, if that feature goes away, then we'll just rely on the chat. Um, but again, my name is Himokan o Emilcon en Español. And I think what I will say is that the first thing, I was born in Venezuela. Spanish was actually my first language. I learned to read and write in Spanish first. And then halfway through first grade, my parents moved to, out of all places, Connecticut. And none of us knew any English. The main reason that we moved there is because we wanted better economic opportunities. We meeting my parents because I didn't know anything. I was too little. Uh, and I started at my regular neighborhood school. And that school only taught English. And as having left Venezuela in the middle of first grade, I could already read and write in Spanish. I was like pretty good at school. Like I enjoyed it. I, I felt like I was good at it. And then I got to the school. It was Marvin Elementary in Norwalk, Connecticut. I felt really, really out of place. I couldn't understand what the teacher was saying. I couldn't understand pretty much anything that was happening. And after coming home every day for a week crying, my parents said, maybe there's something else or somewhere else we can send them. And they found this dual language school across town. That was Silver Mine Elementary. And that's where I went from the rest of first grade through fourth grade. And so for me, bilingual education took the form of what we now would call transitional bilingual education. The goal of that program wasn't to make me bilingual biliterate. It was really to say, hey, we know that you speak Spanish. We know that you can read in Spanish. Let's capitalize on those skills as we teach you English. And then once you know enough English, we'll put you back in a regular English only classroom. And that's what happened. After fourth grade, I went back to my regular neighborhood school. Uh, the reason I say all this is because what that meant for me is that I went from an environment where I was only speaking and reading in Spanish to an environment where I was doing both. And then after from fourth grade on, it was really predominantly, my instruction was really predominantly in English. And that brings me to a second point, which is that, and you'll see this in the session, I'm sure there are folks who would wish that I would conduct a session only in Spanish or only in English, but the reality is that that's not exactly how language always works. It's not like we can just turn them on and off at leisure. And there's actually a really cool study that I'm citing here at the bottom. And you'll see that throughout, that any study that I, or any kind of information that I give, I try to cite. And so in this case, um, in this particular study, the idea is that by virtue of being bilingual, biliterate, you have these two languages that are constantly swimming around in your mind. And whether you realize it or not, the language both languages or three languages, whatever number, are always there 
the difference is which one gets activated most. And it could be due to the person who's speaking it. It could be to the word that's being used. But it's not like this language is ever really dormant. It's there. It just might not be as activated as the other one. Which is to say that it's really artificial to think of language or being bilingual as kind of like being in a box. Like, oh, this is my English box and this is my Spanish box. We're constantly forging cross-linguistic transfer. Our brain is doing that. The question is, is our instruction facilitating that, maximizing that? Uh, one other thing that I'd like to say, you're giving up your Saturday morning, so I'll just be very direct. The idea, and I'll stop sharing this because it's not relevant to what's on the slide. I'm, I'm sure, I know, there's been some discussion around how much of the science of reading is relevant for bilingual, biliterate individuals? Do we really have to heed any of the findings from the science of reading? And the re as a response to that, I would say two things. The first is that it is unequivocally true that historically, the language that has been primarily studied in terms of reading acquisition is English. And there's tons of reasons why that's the case. And that is true. However, that does not mean that we don't have anything to learn from that body of research. And it does not mean that we do not have research being conducted in other languages about other languages. So to the extent that people, you've heard people say, oh, SOR, that's not relevant for us. They don't look at our language. That is just not true. And it speaks to a lack of awareness about the literature that is there on Spanish reading acquisition, on French reading acquisition, on Portuguese reading acquisition, on Chinese reading acquisition. So to me, the idea that we want all of our students to become literate is not something that is controversial or sh should not be something that is controversial. The question is, how do we make that happen? How do we foster that? And I think that requires understanding some of this body of research. So uh, as a brief agenda, here's what I'll say. And if that doesn't make sense, or if you have kind of like strong thoughts about that, please do let me know through the chat. Uh, but an outline of what we'll be covering today. Primero, quiero empezar explicando algunos elementos uh, como fondo para que nosotros podamos apreciar por qué una estructura de cuando estamos enseñando a leer o escritura en español, ¿por qué tiene que contener algunos elementos? This is what I'm calling the why. Lo importante, yo me imagino para todos nosotros, es ¿cuáles son los elementos? What are the actual elements that go into a Spanish routine? Well, we'll start with this backdrop. Uh, for folks who are in the SOR world, this is not unfamiliar. You and I are here today because we want our students to comprehend what they are reading. That is not controversial. It turns out, however, that in order for us to get what we want, which is reading comprehension, we need several buckets of skills. Sometimes we call them domains, doesn't really matter. These buckets of skills, there's two of them. The first one is what they're calling word recognition. You can think of it as decoding. How good at are you at reading what's on the page? at saying what's on the page. That's all that decoding is. That is what they're calling word recognition. But obviously that's not enough. If you're really good at reading the words, but you don't know what they mean, you don't know how to use them, that is not going to lead to comprehension. So the second piece that we need is this thing that we're calling language comprehension. And for our purposes today, you can think of language comprehension as being basically oral comprehension. If you're having a conversation with someone orally, are they able to keep up? If you're reading a book out loud in your kinder classroom, are they able to make inferences about what might happen next? That would fall all under the umbrella of language comprehension. They're not looking at print. This is about the machinations of their mind. And really importantly, it is not the case that you can use a strength in one of these domains to make up for a weakness in the other. That's just not how it works. Because if it did, then all we'd have to do is say, oh, Jimmy cannot decode the words, but that's okay. I'm just going to get them really good at vocabulary and they'll be fine. It turns out that these two domains are effectively multiplied. Anything times zero is zero. This, sometimes abbreviated as SVR, longhand, simple view of reading, is around from the 80s, really, late 70s and 80s, primarily from the work of Tanmer and Goff. 
a reasonable question is, Tamir and Goff are doing all of their work, and I can never remember if it's Goff or Go, but that, I guess that's just me. Um, but Tanmer et al., this is work that was done primarily in English. So going back to one of my main propositions, which is that we actually do have research that's being done in Spanish. Do we have any validation of the simple view in Spanish? Sí, sí la tenemos. En español le dicen no simple view, sino concepción simple de lectura. Significa exactamente lo mismo. Este es un artículo que fue publicado hace cinco años. Fíjate la diferencia. Este trabajo viene de los 80. Este, 2017. No es el único, ni es el primero, pero es mucho más reciente. Igual, el tema es igual. La comprensión lectora, reading comprehension, es el producto de dos cosas. Comprensión oral, lo que un estudiante puede uh, entender o apreciar basado en lo que estamos hablando, lo que está escuchando, y también lo que en español, this is a mouthful, descodificación, word recognition, decoding. Tal vez la única diferencia es que cuando estemos hablando de descodificación, depende del estudio que estés pensando, es importante distinguir entre la precisión, how accurate are you reading the word, accurately, versus how fluent are you at reading the word or the sentences or the groups of words or whatever, right? So notice that these two models are the same. It's just that when we're looking at the Spanish simple view, in other words, what predicts reading comprehension in Spanish, it might actually be really important to take two aspects of decoding into account, not just how accurately you can read the word, but how fluent, i.e. with what level of speed. So fundamentally, we're talking about the same model, SOR is relevant in biliteracy acquisition. And I would argue that it's even more relevant because in a bi, in a dual language setting, as I'll frame it, we have half the amount of time to cover twice the amount of content. Let me stop sharing this for a second. Time is the one resource in education that you are never going to have more of. It's just not gonna happen. So whatever, we, whatever amount of time we spend doing X is time that we're not spending doing Y. So whatever that X is had better be the most important thing, i.e. what's gonna give us the most bang for the buck. So that's kind of one idea that when we talk about reading comprehension, we wanna be hitting decoding, word recognition, descodificación, as well as building oral language. Think about that in terms of background knowledge, in terms of vocabulary, in terms of syntax, et cetera. The other idea here is literacy itself. We kind of take literacy for granted, at least in some societies and some cultures now. Literacy, that act of, in this case, writing or reading, that's actually a very recent phenomenon. Humans were not primed for becoming literate. It is not something that we learn just by magic. It is something that we learn through instruction. Literacy requires rewiring pathways in the brain. If that were not the case, if it were as easy to become literate as it is to speak, then we would not have the high levels of illiteracy that we have. In effect, if you think of oral language, in this case being represented by those lips, oral language we are primed for. Most people born from anywhere are able to typically acquire the language that they have been surrounded by. All it requires is exposure. We hear that expression, oh, kids are like sponges. Yeah, they're sponges for some things. If all we needed was exposure for literacy, then you and I wouldn't be here. Because all we'd have to do is read really cool books to kids and they would just become literate. And how amazing would that be? Our brains have not evolved for that. Literacy is too recent an invention. So instead, what it means to become literate is that we have to take this oral language that is naturally occurring, that we learn seemingly by exposure, and we have to have some kind of translation or transduction where we take that oral language and we make it be represented in print. That is the act of becoming literate. literate. 
it requires some kind of transformation. En español se dice la al, oh, alfabetización, the act of becoming literate. And there's tons of different ways that we can represent this speech in print. I'll go through three examples that I think are relevant, but I'll pause. Any questions, the group is small enough that I can ask. Any questions, comments, or pushback, concerns that you want to bring to the group? I mean, it is a Saturday morning, but maybe I'm just extra um, convincing. So here we are. Or maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe that's, maybe that's the idea. So from here, let's look at three different transformations that we can have, where we're taking oral language and we're trying to represent it in print. Let's start with Zhongwen. I do not speak Chinese very well anymore, but I used to at one point in time in college. Uh, what you look at in the middle column is, <laughs> is uh, the number of distinct spoken syllables that Chinese has. The way that this works, they looked at a corpus of 20,000 words, the most frequent 20,000 words in each language. And they said, well, if we were to break up those words into syllables, where, what number would we come up with? And for Chinese, they found this number. Notice that depending on the material that you're using, you're gonna get different numbers. This particular set is coming from um, a thesis dissertation from actually about seven years ago or so. In any case, about 1300 distinct spoken syllables. This is May. This is May. This is May. They all sound exactly the same, even in my broken English Spanish accented Chinese. These are all second tone Chinese words. Notice that if you look at them, there's not necessarily something that is exactly the same about them, despite the fact that they are exactly the same in terms of pronunciation. That is one example of a transformation. You have these words, in this case, syllables that you're saying, and they're represented one way or another. These characters are representing the syllable that you have said. There's no way to break that up anymore. In English, we have about 7,000 distinct syllables. Again, in the 20,000 most recently occurring words, most frequently occurring words. Uh, so for example, if you look at the word rain, that's just one syllable. In the word bacon, specifically the first syllable, that's bay. And in play, those are all syllables that we have in English. In English, we have a bit more of the speech system being broken up because when you say rain, you really do hear more sounds. Those are the sounds that we're representing here. It turns out that that vowel sound, A, is being spelled A-I there. When you say bacon, B, A, that open syllable, A, there are two sounds. It's a question of how we're going to spell the syllable. We can't break up Chinese like that. You can say, oh, may, M, A, I want to spell it like this. You can't do that. Here, you can. Now you have a few options for spelling the vowel sound. In, uh, in español, mi mamá dice que el inglés es loco. Nunca se escribe como suena. That's what she says. And this is a good example of that in her eyes. English is crazy. You say A, but you spell it like this or like this or like this. That doesn't make sense. There's actually a reason. And there's even though it feels like it's crazy, English is remarkably predictable if you know what makes it predictable. In this case, we're talking about the open syllable, a vowel team and another vowel team. A-Y and A-I are not interchangeable. You're never going to find A-Y in the middle of a syllable. It's only going to come at the end. So yes, you have options for spelling the long A, but those options are circumscribed. And that is what we would be teaching on the English side. I see a question came up. Yeah, so I would answer that very directly. And I would say, this is oral language. You cannot talk about language comprehension, or even on the English side, you cannot talk about language comprehension without leveraging oral language. The things that fall under the domain of language comprehension include things like learning new words, learning how to put those words together to form sentences. That's what we call syntax. Learning where this context is coming from, background knowledge. This is not about decoding. If it was about decoding only, you would not have this box at all. You would just have this and that. You are not going to find any serious academic say, reading comprehension is only about decoding. That would be statistically inaccurate and it would be false just on its face 
So um, Sarah, I don't know if that is the question that you were asking, but the idea that we want to convey is that we have to have all of these buckets represented in our literacy block. And these buckets, in this case, language comprehension includes, you cannot teach language comprehension without leveraging using oral language. Now, the final and perhaps most relevant example of this transformation, where we're taking what we're saying and representing it in print in some way, is of course, el español. En español, eh, piensa en ese diptongo E, como en peine, o eras, that's actually not the word that I want. The word that I want is era. There's no S there. That's gonna nag me. Es un animal, you can look it up. I never heard of it until recently. Era. Um, y seis. Todas estas sílabas contienen el mismo diptongo E, lo escribimos de la misma manera E. Este es un ejemplo de un lenguaje cuya ortografía es bien transparente. And this is why my mom says that English is crazy, because in comparison to Spanish, that is so transparent, English does have more variation. Cuando tú dices E en español, tú sabes que se va a escribir con e -I o con e -Y. But it would be a lie to say that you know exactly how it's going to be spelled because as you'll see later on, there will be times when you hear the same diphthong, diphthong A and you're going to spell it E-Y instead of E-I. The point that I'm trying to make here is that different languages go about making this conversion in different ways. And it just so happens that in English and in Spanish, we both care about the sounds. We both care about this thing that we call phonemic awareness. To the extent that we can split up the sounds in a syllable, in a word, that is going to help us spell that word. In Spanish, you have a lot fewer options for spelling those sounds. It's more transparent. In English, we have more options, especially if it's vowels, but it's still not random. It is still not arbitrary. You need phonemic awareness for both. What you don't do, well, I'll ask you this first. All of these nine words, may, 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 and these, what do they all have in common? It's not a rhetorical question. Oh, you're killing me. They all have the same vowel sound. A, 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 A. Oh, and someone's using IPA. <laughs> a, A, A. But they're spelled differently. If you know how to identify, if you're a Chinese speaker and you know how to identify that A sound because you have it in Chinese, why would we not leverage that information when I'm teaching you English or when I'm teaching you Spanish? We absolutely should. That is my big proposition for you today, that because of how these two languages, English and Spanish, have chosen to construct their orthographic system, their spelling, we must, we should leverage what overlaps across languages. Sometimes what gets called cross-linguistic transfer. And it's not just about cognates. Cognates is scratching the surface. It goes much deeper than that. The big idea for me here is that we do not memorize syllables. En español, mucho menos en inglés, no nos estamos memorizando las sílabas. That is grossly inefficient. Look. That's a lot of things that you would have to memorize. Tenemos 27 letras en español y 26 letras en inglés. Es verdad que en inglés hay que memorizarse otras combinaciones. Por ejemplo, CH es CH. Es igual en español. SH es SH. No la tenemos en español. But even if you're memorizing those specific graphemes, esos grafemas, no van a llegar a 7,000. Van a ser menos de 100. In español, menos todavía. What you are teaching are correspondences between what we hear and what we're spelling. You are not teaching the memorization of syllables. That is grossly inefficient. You do not have the time. Especially not when you're trying to get kids to learn to read in two languages. So what's the big idea for me? You're like, oh my gosh, when is he getting to like the actual structure? I promise it's coming. A tier one routine in any language, 
should be comprehensive. What do I mean when I say comprehensive? I mean that you're covering the different elements of the simple view. If you're only talking about decoding, you're missing a big part of the puzzle. If you're only teaching oral language, that is great. Jimmy's gonna be able to learn new words and he might even be able to use those words. That is not literacy. These two elements have to be present in any true tier one routine. The other piece is that we don't have the time to mess around. We need to be efficacious. One way to be efficacious is to be explicit. This is what I want you to know, Jimmy, about Spanish. And to teach it in such a way that connects to what they already know. At least that's what that picture is trying to convey. But when it does that, I don't know, but in my head it does. Lastly, because it's a routine, it needs to be predictable or predecible, consistent. To me, that's a given. A routine has to be that. Otherwise, it's not a routine. It's a hodgepodge. So to the extent that we have a routine that meets those three different criteria, we have a routine that at least is set up to maximize learning in our students. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I accidentally asked Stacey to unmute. Now, from here, we can move on to the actual elements of a really any routine for teaching literacy with Spanish examples. So in this slide, I'm going to try to convince you that the elements that I'm laying out do a good job of covering the different elements in terms of SVR. If there is no element of oral language development, I don't know what you're doing. We, what is the point of becoming literate if we, are, we have no way to use that language? Oral language came first. Print did not come first. So my question for you now is how do we, what is one common activity that we use, whether we call it this or not, to build oral language? Yeah, so like we read to our kids, we talk to our kids. And what I'm saying here is, hey, this domain, the oral comprehension or language comprehension domain, this maps to that. When you're doing a read aloud, you are building oral language. Can we do that a little bit more intentionally though? Can we maybe, instead of trying to read five different books in the week, can we read the same book or the same book in parts throughout the week? And in doing so, we can talk to our students about some really interesting or novel vocabulary. That is very much this. Or about, oh, this is a weird sentence that we have that we don't typically see or hear. That's syntax or syntaxis in Espanol. That is just as important. My proposition is that we can use the read aloud to build these very discrete elements of language. Of course, background knowledge is kind of the elephant in the room that we're always trying to build for all of our students. So I'm not gonna belabor the point because to me, this is part probably the most natural kind of element that should be present in any structured literacy blog. Lisa, I don't know that I would, I think the reason why there's controversy is because, so I'll, I'll be very honest. I know this is being recorded, so this is gonna live on the internet forever, but I'll say it like this. If you are trying to teach Spanish in a setting where reading acquisition in English does not matter, you can get away with a lot of non-explicit incidental instruction because Spanish is so transparent which is to say that I think historically, because we hadn't looked at Spanish acquisition as much, we have this misconception that in Spanish, if I just teach you the syllables, you learn to read. And that it doesn't really get any deeper than that. That A is not true, because if you go to Spanish speaking countries, you have children who are trying to become literate in Spanish and can't because of what, some people might call phonological difficulties. And B, in this setting, in a DLI setting, that's out of the question because you do want the kids to become literate in English. 
And so I would say that it's not so much because there's been a lack of research in Spanish. It's because the tension that you're describing, it's because we got complacent in thinking that most kids were going to learn to read in Spanish no matter how we taught it. So what does it really matter? It matters because you're trying to teach them two languages. It matters because we have kids who are struggling to read in Spanish outside of whether or not they're learning to read and write in English because of phonological difficulties. But because of the transparency of Spanish, you can imagine the transparency of Spanish as being kind of like a like an anchor. It lifts you up. It helps you overcome potential difficulties. So you're less likely to have, in terms of population, you're going to have fewer people who struggle to become literate in Spanish than who struggle to become literate in English. So Lisa, I don't know if like that made any sense at all, but I, I think it's, I think it's complacency. I think we just assume like, well, Spanish is so easy to get. Like what, what's, the, there's not much to this. This is a dual language setting. There's a lot to this. I would argue it's actually a lot harder to become literate in Spanish and in English than to become literate in just one or the other. Now, the other piece or another element that we should have in a literacy block is this idea of the alphabetic principle. Please, this is kind of like a super formal term. This is the arrow that you saw like five slides ago. How do we take what we say to how we spell it? That's what that arrow is. In Espanol and English, usamos letras. In Chino, no se usa letras. They use characters. Given that we use letters, we need to teach what are the correspondences that go together. When I hear this sound, how am I going to spell it? When I hear that sound, how am I going to spell it? So this is an example of what this might look like if I was teaching this in Spanish. Supongamos que yo estoy enseñando la, um, la vocal A. Lo primero que yo le voy a decir a los estudiantes es que tenemos cinco vocales en español. Y fíjate que la boca la tengo casi cerrada. Y abro la boca un poquito más. E, I, E, A. Ups, no quiero escribir la letra. A es la boca más abierta que vas a tener en español. A. Este es el sonido de la A en español. Ahora, let's suppose that you are working with a English dominant speaker who is now in your Spanish literacy block. How does that kid get to this Spanish sound, A? Ah. Well, there's two ways they could do it. They could start with the English A, ah, which is right there. A. Ah. Okay, this is the English A ah, as an apple. A. Ah. Abre la boca más. A. Ah. There's your A. Ah. You literally have to go from, if you wanted to go from the A ah, and apple, A. Ah, A. Ah. Your mouth opens a lot more. That would be one way to make the connection. So you start here, Jimmy. Abre la boca. Empuja la boca para abajo. In, uh, Spanish vowels are very tight. They should feel tenseness in their mouth. Another way to get to that same sound would be from the English A ah, as an ox. That sound, very similar to English, ah, 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 ah. You're not really changing the aperture of your mouth. What you're changing is the shape of your lips. Ah, ah. These are the kinds of connections that you could be making if you're leveraging what that kid is bringing to you. In that case, that's an, maybe it's an English monolingual. Maybe they don't even know Spanish. You're trying to get to this sound. Abre la boca, a, ah, it should feel very tight. In any case, so you've taught this vowel. Ese es el sonido, a, ah. ¿cuál es el sonido? A, ah, okay. En español se escribe así, a. Ah. Now let's suppose that I've already taught them la L, la M y la P. I wrote it, I don't know if you can see it. There you go. Well, there's a glare, so ignore it. L, M, y P. If that is what they have already learned, then I'm going to do something like this. Porque en español yo quiero que ellos estén pensando tanto en la sílaba como en los sonidos. Entonces, la palabra es mapa. Dime, los, dime las sílabas en mapa. Ma, pa. Muy bien. ¿Cuál es la primera sílaba? Ma. ¿Cuál es la segunda sílaba? Pa. Muy bien. ¿Cuál es la primera otra? ¿Y cuál es la palabra? Mapa. Ok. La primera sílaba. Ma. Ok. ¿Cuáles son los sonidos? Mm, a. Ok. Escríbelos. 
Mm, ah, la sílaba, ma. Ok, la palabra era mapa. ¿Cuál es la segunda sílaba? Pa. Ok, los sonidos. A. Ok. La sílaba, pa. Ok, ahora escribo los sonidos. Pa. A. Ahora. Ma. Pa. ¿Cuál es la palabra? Mapa. It is, it should be uncontroversial that we have sounds in Spanish. It should be uncontroversial that those sounds get represented in print. It should be uncontroversial that we do the same thing in English. It should be controversial that you ask kids to memorize syllables in Spanish because there's over a thousand of them. Why would we want our children to memorize syllables when we can teach the one-to-one -one correspondence? That is not teaching Spanish in a white way. It is not teaching Spanish in an English way. It is teaching Spanish in a way that is most conducive to transferring information from one language to the other. To the extent that you've ever worked with a kid in kinder learning to read and write in Spanish, you will know how quickly we cap out in terms of memorizing the syllables. When we teach only the syllable in Spanish, mame mi mo mu, la le li lo lu, sa se si so su, what you're asking them to memorize is a whole bunch of correspondences as though they're arbitrary. This is not arbitrary. Tú dices A y se escribe A. Tú dices E, se escribe E. If anything, kids are going to learn to read faster. And there's actually an article that I can cite um, co-authored by Ari, Linnea Ari, like orthographic mapping Ari, like Ari's face is Ari, where she and a, a group of researchers in Brazil were looking at teaching Brazilian students Portuguese starting with the phoneme. They compared it to a group that was learning to read using only syllables. I think you know what they found. So from this, uh, when you hear the term alphabetic principle, that is what I want you to think about. Now, the other piece that I think is important to include is that notice that I, I want to make this explicit. This idea of alphabetic principle, that would map very closely to here. This is the word recognition domain. So we're covering this one through this one. We're covering this element through, or we're covering word recognition through the alphabetic principle. This question of morphological awareness is covering both of those pieces because a morpheme or un morfema tells you what the chunk looks like, como se escribe, what it sounds like, como suena, y que significa. A classic example, I'm not going to do it on the right word because I know we're running out of time, is spect. In English, spect es un morfema, like, oh, spectacle or spectacular. En español también. Espectáculo con acento en la A. My point to you, why would you teach those? Uh, spectacle. Why would you teach those two words as cognates when you can teach the morpheme? A cognate is una palabra que suena igual o se escribe igual o parecida en ambos idiomas. That only gives them one word or two if you're saying, well, one in English, one in Spanish. But if you teach a morpheme, in this case a root, there's other words, both in English and in Spanish, that both come from that root. So if you're saying, but wait, I don't see, you talk a lot, well, you talk somewhat about cross-linguistic transfer, but I don't see cognates here. This is where the cognates are. This is where the cognates are. This is not an extra, this is the core. But my point is that morphological awareness is covering both decoding and language comprehension. And finally, we need to have an opportunity for students to actually apply or use that information. It is not enough for us to be teaching this and talking about it and doing it together if they don't have an opportunity to actually employ that. So what book are they reading independently? Does that book enable them to practice the things that you've been teaching? What are they being asked to spell? Whether it's a word, a sentence, 
o en response to a prompt. En español usamos la palabra dictado. Te digo, um, it should not be controversial que si yo te he estado enseñando una oración o un párrafo durante la semana y es solamente ese párrafo, I would, I had better expect that by the end of the week, you get really good at spelling that paragraph. For the love of Christ, that's what I've been doing. We've been working on this sentence, this paragraph for the last week. Normalmente cuando yo digo dictado en español, eso es que la gente se imagina. Un dictado donde la oración o el párrafo no cambia de lunes, martes, viernes, bla, 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 bla. Eso no tiene nada de malo, pero no es lo mismo que yo estoy diciendo aquí. This is about la demostración, la aplicación de las cosas que yo te he enseñado. So if I have been using that dictado to teach you some aspect of the alphabetic principle, to teach you some morphine, I am going to want to include something, a word, a phrase, that wasn't in that paragraph originally to see how well you are generalizing. That is the goal of this instruction, to generalize. Now, I don't have the time to convince you of this, but my hope is that if you were to take these same elements, that is, or language development, alphabetic principle, morphological awareness and application, think of this as a you do, if I'm gonna use those terms, and you were to analyze them from the perspective of, are you enabling transfer? That you would be, depending on the content that you're teaching and how you're teaching it. So in this case, I'm saying, look, it's comprehensive. And here I'm trying to say, well, it's also efficacious because it's explicit and it's making connections. So what I will leave you with is this idea. In any setting, but specifically in a dual language setting, you can't just develop oral language. That's a huge missed opportunity. There has to be some instruction on literacy acquisition. The second piece is that if we are, we are not making this cross-linguistic transfer explicit and we're not building from that, then what are we doing? We're leaving way too much instruction on the table. With that, I know it's 8.45, right on the dot, I, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning. This QR code just has two questions. I'm not collecting your personal information. I'm not trying to like spam you with emails. I just want to know what was most helpful and what you would have changed. That's it. So I'll leave this QR code up for a moment. If you are willing and able to take it, I would greatly appreciate it. And in a few seconds, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bain for her to officially close out the session. But again, thank you so, so much. I feel like I literally just talked at you for 45 minutes, but at least it was only 45 minutes. Hopefully you get to enjoy the rest of your Saturday morning. Um, I do see there were some comments in the chat, so I will. Pr I promise to be addressing those, um, but I wanna make sure that Stacey has an opportunity to close out before it gets super late. Muchisimas gracias. Oh my goodness. I think that you were the best thing that has uh, happened in the last couple of months. So that was such a good <laughs> and, and the comments that are coming in are depicting that that was super, super helpful. So once again, you did not disappoint. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Himmelkan and Ciarte. You are an individual that we will continue to think with. Um, and in order to think with you, you do have some of your published content on the Educate website. This is not a commercial, but people are thinking, uh, how would what granularity would you like around the Spanish literacy routines that Himmelkan and I have had the opportunity to author? You can find those there. There was a question in the chat. Himmelkan, do you have word card or mouth cards between Spanish and English? Do you mind just sharing about the exciting thing that's going to happen on January 21st? So I am working on mouth maps, which is exactly what it sounds like, a map of how to go from the sounds in one language to the sounds in the other. It isn't just about articulating the sound. I think that is important. It is about showing a kid how we go from one articulation to the other. Whether you're an English dominant speaker, in this case, going to Spanish or a Spanish dominant speaker going to English. That will be launched on January 9th. January 9th, that's even better. That's fantastic. That's right, January 9th, because I think on January 21st, you and I are going to do another session on Spanish literacy instruction. 
So we'll get that up and going in terms of the registration link for the 21st, but January 9th, I cannot wait. I'm going to uh, be a customer for you and get those cards. Okay, best friends. Well, that is all. We have some more information. Here's Himmelkon's information. Himmelkon is so cool. He just started his own company in the midst of being a PhD candidate. So his company is called BASIC. Himmelkon, would you like to say what BASIC stands for? Um, no, not really. But I, I, instead, I'll just say that my wife compelled me and actually Stacy indirectly. I just started an Instagram account last night because yeah. I think it's something that I should be doing, according to my wife. Um, all this to say uh, to the question that was asked in the chat, um, where would we find these? The short answer is the website eventually. But in the meantime, I'll be posting kind of like previews and snippets on my Instagram because I don't like I'm not like I'm not super social media savvy. So like, I don't know, but that's where it'll that's where you'll get some updates until the final product launches on the site. Um, oh, and I don't live in Reville, California. I live in Roseville. I misspelled it. But there we go. <laughs> yeah. That sounds good. Well, we'll definitely get the word out when those uh, materials are ready for everybody. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Himmelkan. That was compelling. And we're looking forward to seeing you all in January. Until then, be well. And we are always available to chat with you because we are doing compelling work together. We got this, everybody. Have a great day.